Welcome everyone. If you're just joining us, a quick reminder that you can submit questions using the questions tab at the top of your screen. We'll take as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. And if we don't get to your question, don't hesitate to send it to webinar at neoforj.com and we'll have someone follow up with you. Be sure to post about today's event using hashtag Neo4j and you'll be entered to win some really cool Neo4j swag. And now here's Lance Walter to introduce our next session, Analytics and Graphs, the Neo4j connector for Apache Spark. All right, thank you, Marilee. Well, we're really excited to bring our partner solution architect, David Allen, back up to the virtual stage here at Neo4j Connections to talk about a really exciting recent development in the Neo4j connector for Apache Spark. Andrea Santurbano is Chief Technical Officer at our partner, Laris. Prior to Laris, Andrea spent six years at Reply as a senior IT consultant. Andrea holds a degree in information technology and automation from Universita Politecnica de la Marcha. Apache Spark, as mentioned, has become an incredibly popular technology in the enterprise for data integration, for data orchestration. And so to talk about how to really take advantage of that in your graph applications, let's welcome David and Andrea. Thank you very much, Lance, for that introduction. I am David Allen. I am a technology partner architect here at Neo4j, and my job happens to be a lot of fun because I get to play with Neo4j in combination with all of these different technologies. And today we're going to talk about our new uh, Neo4j connector for Apache Spark and all of the different things that I can that it can do. With me today, I have one of our good partners of Neo4j from Laris, uh, Andrea. Would you like to inter introduce yourself? Hi everybody, I'm Andres Turbano. I'm a CTO in uh, Laris Business Automation, which is uh, um, an Italian prime partner of Neo4j, and uh, we are who built the Neo4j Spark connector. So. I hope that you enjoy the presentation and I hope that you are all safe in these hard times. So. All right, so let's get started. Now, because this particular connector is a developer focused tool that you can use to build new stuff together with your graphs, right up front, we wanted to tell you the fastest possible way to get started. On your screen, you're gonna see some, some instructions of how you can clone a GitHub repository and get started with your own little test environment. This is going to come with Docker Compose files that stand up all of the infrastructure necessary. So you really only need a couple of commands to launch the connector an instance of Spark and an instance of Neo4j together so that you can follow along and use some of the examples that we're going to provide. Later on, if you want to download the connector, you can always get a copy of it from GitHub releases and you can check the documentation that's on Neo4j's website. The important thing is, is that the connector we're going to be talking about today is version four of the connector. So make sure if you download a release that you're getting the 4.0 version and not the 2.4 version that's out there um, on either the website or GitHub. So when you download that repository, you create a local copy and you stand up the infrastructure, you're going to be shown uh, Zeppelin, which is a notebook uh, interface that allows us to write code together with Neo4j and Spark and test it out iteratively. And this is an example of what you'll see in that sample repo where we have basic reading examples. It comes with instructions and customizable code in line. So you can simply run that code paragraph at a time and it will talk to the sample Neo4j database that is set up inside of the Docker Compose configuration. So before we get into what the connector is and how it works, um, in the graph ecosystem, a lot of folks are still new to Spark and they may be asking themselves how Spark adds to the workflow or what, what niche it fits into. So we wanted to talk a little bit about what Spark is at its core. It's really an analytics engine that's intended for large scale data processing. Um, Spark is itself a cluster. So typically a Spark instance consists of a lot of different worker nodes, which um, take large operations, partition them into a set of operations and then execute them in parallel. So for example, if you have a table and the table has a billion records in it and you wanna to filter to only the records that contain the zip code 23226, you might take that table of one billion records, chop it up into various segments and then do the filtering operation across a lot of machines in parallel. And so Apache Spark is really great when you need to do this large scale data processing type of workflow. Um, in, in the Spark world, it's fundamentally based around SQL and this idea of data frames, which are effectively tables. And so what's really special about Spark is 
how many other systems that it connects to. And so in the graphic here on the right, you're going to see that Spark has the ability to import and export to just about any kind of data format or data technology that's out there under the sun, including things like Cassandra, Hadoop, Redshift, and many, many others. And so really at its core, what the Neo4j connector for Apache Spark is, is adding Neo4j and graphs to that mix. So a lot of folks are using Spark as this central point of coordination where a lot of different data and technologies can come together. So the next question is, when do you need Apache Spark within your enterprise or your company? Basically, there's a couple of hallmarks where you know that Spark might be the right approach. The first is if you have a really large data set that might be profitably broken into pieces for processing. Another is if you have a really complicated pipeline where you have a lot of different sources of information or where you have to do a lot of transformation to your data to get it from the format it's coming from to the format where you need it to go. And Spark happens to be particularly good for iterative algorithms. And so it grew up in this world of map and reduce. And so you can take an operation, apply it to a data set, apply another operation, apply a further operation. That's what I mean by iterative algorithms on large data sets. Um, at the bottom, and when we distribute these slides, there's a great article that, that's called The What, When, and Why of Apache Spark that I'd recommend if you want further reading on this. And uh, to talk a little bit more about what the connector isn't, I'm going to pass it over to Andrea, and who will tell us a little bit about the history and how we came here. Yeah, thank you, David. So uh, there are uh, some difference between this uh, new connector and the old one. So uh, the Fordoto release, which is the the new release uh, about the new connector, uh, replaces the all the uh, Spark Community Connector, which is basically the version 2.x, 2.5.4.5, M1 and M2. And we uh, leverage the new Spark Data Source API in order to be fully Spark compliant with this new connector. This means that there are uh, breaking changes. So unfortunately, all the all the Spark jobs that you wrote uh, uh, with the old connector are not working anymore and you need to write a new one with uh, this new connector. So uh, uh, what is this connector? Basically, the Neo4j Spark connector allows to extract and ingest data uh, from and to Neo4j within Spark environments using, as I said before, the data source CPI. This allows us uh, uh, so to read and write uh, uh, information from uh, Antonio4j, and we allow uh, the developers to read information uh, from Neo4j graphs and transform this information uh, within data frames, which are tables, in three ways. So you can extract uh, uh, nodes via labels, you can extract uh, uh, paths via relationships, and you can uh, provide your own safer query in order to uh, uh, extract any kind, any uh, arbitrary graph structure from uh, your graph database inside a data frame as well. So in a very similar way, uh, we allow to ingest uh, nodes via labels, relationships, and also we allow the developers to uh, provide their own cipher queries in order to uh, uh, transform any data frame to any other graph ar arbitrary graph structure. So uh, why would you want this? Uh, uh, in order to do uh, basically two big uh, uh, class of applications. So you want to uh, uh, create a, an ETL graph pipeline or you want to uh, uh, use a graph-driven machine learning in order to uh, find insights from uh, uh, your data set. So uh, let's dive into the, 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 the three read approaches. As I said, we have nodes, relationship, and uh, the safer query. So uh, how you can uh, uh, extract uh, nodes into a data frame via the new Spark connector. Basically, as you can see here, the, the API, it's very clean and simple. You only need to define the option labels with a column separated list of uh, uh, labels that you want to extract from Neo4j. 
and, uh, and then you, you will uh, uh, load that information uh, into a, a data frame. In a very similar way, you can extract path from, uh, paths from uh, uh, Neo4j by uh, relationship. In this case, you need to, to use the uh, option relationship, both in uh, this case, and you also need to define the source and target node labels. In this case, so we are basically extracting all the person that bought a product. And uh, uh, the third way is uh, via Cypher query. And uh, uh, also in this, uh, in this case, it's very simple because you only need to define the option query and then put in it uh, your, uh, your custom Cypher query. In a very similar way, we allow to ingest uh, any data frame inside the Neo4j in uh, three ways. So we have, uh, you can ingest a, a data frame into nodes, or you can ingest a data frame into relationships, in, and you can uh, 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 transform a data frame into any arbitrary graph structure via your Cypher query. In this case, please uh, uh, look at the slide. You can, uh, uh, for instance, we, can, we are defining a merge operation over a person and we are defining name and, and age uh, as properties. As you can see in the uh, Cypher query, we, we refer to a special uh, object uh, called event, which represents the data frame row. So you can access, you can access to uh, every column of the data, fra of the data frame by, the by using the dot notation over the uh, uh, object event. So in uh, all three cases, uh, under the hood, we uh, collect a batch of data frame rows, and uh, then we uh, push them to an unwind operation, which is one of the best practice uh, uh, that you should use uh, while tra you are trying to ingest data into new 4 j Here we have uh, a very simple, uh, uh, four very simple jobs uh, uh, written in Python, so via PySpark. On the left-hand side, we are trying to read data from uh, Spark. The, the one on top, uh, uh, we are extracting uh, nodes uh, by providing uh, the labels. Uh, uh, on the bottom, uh, we are extracting uh, uh, the data from Neo4j by uh, our uh, Cypher query. On the right-hand side, we are trying to ingest data uh, into Neo4j, starting from a data frame that we called my data frame. So we have uh, our data frame that can came from uh, any other Spark uh, uh, data source, Spark files, CSV over, over uh, HDFS, and so on. And uh, you can then ingest uh, this data frame into, into Neo4j in a very simple way. So in the case uh, uh, on the top, uh, we are trying to ingest nodes and we are trying to ingest uh, persons that are, are also customers. So, uh, but please look at the uh, method mode uh, in our use case, which is overwrite. It's very important because it defines the way that we uh, build under the hood the, the Cypher query. With overwrite, uh, we are creating uh, under the hood a merge query. If we if we use the uh, other supported save mode, which is error if exist, we build a cipher create query, and you uh, must uh, uh, be aware of this because it's very important uh, for performances. In the same way, in the uh, last example uh, uh, at the bottom, uh, we are trying to ingest. Uh, uh, our data frame uh, as a simple person. And uh, as you can see in the full name, we are concatenating, keep concatenating the name and surname columns. So uh, what, are, what are the requirements of uh, uh, the Neo4j connector for Apache Spark? So we support uh, uh, Neo4j 3.5, 4.0 and uh, 4.1. We support Apache Spark 2.4.5. And uh, uh, APOC are recommended, but uh, uh, not required. This because we use uh, uh, APOC in order to extract uh, uh, metadata from Neo4j in order to create the data frame structure. But we also have a um, fallback mechanism 
but so it, it's not required uh, uh, the APOC. Uh, we support uh, Scala 2.11 and 2.12, and uh, it's quite important because, uh, for instance, Databricks for Spark 2.4 uh, versions uh, only supports uh, Scala 2.11. We don't support at this very moment uh, uh, Spark 3 because uh, it's a, a very new release uh, and we plan to add the support uh, to this version uh, in the new year and all the versions are uh, prior to Spark 2.4. So uh, uh, what are the uh, uh, next steps? So uh, we plan to have uh, better support for Google uh, Data Proc, uh, for AWS CMR, uh, Cloudera and Databricks uh, and so on. We want to uh, uh, expand the integration with the Graph Data Science uh, library, which uh, is a library, uh, is a new 4J library for graph algorithms. And uh, as I said before, we plan to support uh, uh, Spark uh, uh, 3 at the beginning of the next year. Why we uh, use the uh, uh, Data Source uh, API? This because uh, allows us uh, to be fully Spark compliant, and uh, this means that our connector is polyglot. So we support all the four programming languages uh, uh, supported by, by Spark, which are Java, Python, R, and Scala. And this is uh, uh, one of the most important features for any data-driven organization because you got covered the skills of data engineers and data scientists uh, as well. So uh, uh, we uh, use the data, the data source API because uh, uh, we are polyglot. The connector uh, uses uh, under the hood the Neo4j Java driver, so you can tune any Java driver option uh, via the connector. We don't support the graphics and graph frames. We only, we only stick to uh, Spark uh, data structure, so data frames and uh, data sets. So if you have a, a graphics structure like uh, uh, edge RDDs or vertex RDDs or graph frames, you need uh, uh, to, con to convert them into data frames or data sets, and then you can use uh, uh, them with uh, the, the Neo4j Spark connector. So at, at this particular connections event, we have been launching this Neo4j connector for Apache Spark. And in terms of support, we want the story to be as clean and as simple as possible. These connectors that, that work with Neo4j are part of the Neo4j product. And what that means is that if you're an existing enterprise customer and you have a support plan with Neo4j, you're going to receive support for these connectors in much the same way as you do the core product. Uh, the terms of that support is identical to what you use for Neo4j Enterprise Edition, and there's basically just nothing different about it. Uh, if you have a support account, you go submit a, a query in exactly the same way as you normally would, and you'll receive support. Behind the scenes, we have a group of folks who are quite expert with the connector, including some folks um, at Laris who will make sure that all of these issues are resolved and they go through all of the same channels. And so one of the central points about these connectors is that we want to make people's enterprise subscriptions more valuable over time and grow the, the reach of graphs and uh, the technical advantages of using Neo4j as a system. And as a result, there isn't any extra charge. It just comes with Neo4j Enterprise um, if this is a component that you need for your architecture. So we've talked a lot so far about technology and about you know, Python code and Polyglot and the various libraries that are supported. And so now we want to really turn our attention to the whys and the business drivers behind you know, why Neo4j implemented this connector and how we've seen people using it in practice. So in this entire section, we're going to cover basically three key use cases and go into a little bit more detail about um, why they come up. So the first is what I'm going to call data source integration and being able to connect Neo4j to any supported file format or database, of, or, or database that Spark can talk to. The second that we're going to spend some time on is this idea of extraction, transformation, and load, or ETL, and bi-directional ETL jobs in and out of Neo4j.
Finally, we're going to close by talking a little bit about graph-driven machine learning and uh, some of the possibilities that come up with that together with Neo4j. So let's start with data source integration. So one, one of the terms that I used earlier is that I called Spark a point of coordination. And I, I, the reason we call it a point of coordination is that it already supports just about every database under the sun. Now we know that graphs are a very uh, special um, data format um, that's very different than the other things that are out there. And the Spark environment represents this opportunity where if you have an environment where you can get data from any database or data technology into that, and you also have a good connector that connects Spark to Neo4j, then this allows us to do data loading or data interoperability between just about any system under the sun and Neo4j. So Spark in particular, all of the cloud databases are already supported by Spark. Any JDBC database that uses SQL can be supported by Spark. Um, a lot of times as an engineer for Neo4j, I get questions like, how do we load Parquet files into Neo4j? And Spark has the ability to do that. And so essentially as a point of coordination, you can go from anywhere to Spark and then go from Spark to Neo4j or the reverse order just as easily. Now, one of the things that's happening in the Neo4j ecosystem overall is the introduction um, of Neo4j Aura as a managed service for graph databases. And so when folks deploy Neo4j Aura databases, those organizations are typically already fairly cloud native and have a lot of these other technologies at play, whether they are other cloud databases or processing pipelines. And so we're expecting this data source integration problem to be a very, very common thing that a lot of organizations are going to need to solve as they add graphs to existing uh, workflows. And so we see the Spark Connector as a, as a key part of how we can do that data source interoperability in and out of Neo4j and Aura. That brings us to the next major use case. And so I would say day in and day out, this is probably the most common thing that people need to do and that they're already doing with Spark, and that's extraction, transformation, and load. And so the, before we even get into how to do that with the Spark connector, we, we have to first tackle this, this basic question. Neo4j is graphs and Spark is tables, so how do the two connect? Well, is supported connectors, we use a concept that we call tables for labels. Um, the Neo4j data model is what's called labeled property graph. So at the very top, you see that a person has a job. And so you have two nodes and one relationship. Now the nodes have labels such as person and job, and you obviously have relationships and properties that go with that. So tables for labels is a very simple way of taking any labeled property graph and mapping it into a set of tables. So the, in this most simple example, we have three total tables. We have a node, sorry, we have a table for every kind of label in our graph. That means that we have a node person table and a node job table. And we have a table for every relationship type. We'll call this rel has. And so we know that in Neo4j, all nodes get individual IDs and relationships do as well. And so basically we can treat every node, uh, every node label as a table and every relationship as a kind of join table between nodes. So all of the relationship tables end up having from and to attributes while the node tables have always have an ID and they always have whatever properties exist on that, on that, uh, that node label. So this is a really important concept to keep in mind when you're doing ETL to and from Neo4j because it's a simple mapping from relational to graph that will always be there for you. And what's more is that if you can decompose whatever data you're starting with into this structure, then you're always going to have a good option to get it into Neo4j in a performant manner. Because once the data is in this structure, uh, turning that into a graph is very straightforward. So in our ETL pipelines, the very first step that we're usually going to do is to get the data and to prepare it. And so I've got a little simple code example here. We don't have to go through the entire code line by line, but what this code is basically doing is fetching a CSV file from a particular storage bucket, saving that file locally, and then turning it into uh, three data frames according to the table for labels structure. 
we have a city data frame that is a certain set of attributes from that CSV. We have a country data frame that is a different set of attributes. And then we have the city in country relationship. And so with just a couple of lines of code, we can kind of show the tables for labels decomposition idea within Spark by fetching a CSV, decomposing it, and ending up with uh, nodes and relationship tables. So the, the key points to remember about this most simple example is that since Spark supports a lot of different databases and data formalisms, CSV is just an example here. This could just as easily be an Oracle table or even a MongoDB collection. Preparing the data is what we mean by breaking it into that tables for labels structure rather than treating it as one gigantic complicated data frame that might be many columns wide. The, the final step to consider here is that we're typically going to clean data as it is brought into the process. And so in the middle of this code, there's a case where we're dropping duplicates and where we're getting rid of all of the records that are missing a country where the ISO 2 code is null. And so when you're doing load, whether it's to or from Neo4j, one of the principles to keep in mind is the earlier in the process you clean the data up, the better off that you're going to be. So now in step two of our miniature ETL pipeline, we're gonna then take this data and write it to Neo4j. And so what I've got here is a little bit of Python code on the left that writes batches of nodes. Um, the write node batch function at the very top is using the Neo4j connector for Apache Spark to, and if you followed Andrea's examples earlier, where he described how to do writes and we have this mode flag, I'm just using all the same techniques again and providing um, some options to the connector to provide username and password there up front. Now, um, a couple of things to, to keep in mind about this example is that we're writing nodes and relationships separately and we're not actually using Cypher at all in this example. The reason that we're doing that is that it allows us to parallelize and speed up the overall import. I've highlighted in yellow these key bits, like I have repartitioned the data frame to four partitions within Spark, and that allows us to write four times in parallel to Neo4j. Now, the reason that this works really well with Neo4j is that since we've broken it up into just nodes, um, and the nodes are uniquely identified by a key, there are no locking relationships on this write. And that's part of why the write is gonna go so much faster is you can use more hardware on the server. Um, in the case of our relationships at the bottom, I've repartitioned that to one because relationships tend to lock both nodes that are on either side. And so they need to be written in a single threaded kind of a way rather than multi-threaded. The final thing that I've highlighted just to show a little technique that you can use is uh, data frame column mapping. And so in my city data frame, I have the name of a city that the, the attribute in the table is called city, but I want it to be called the name property once it's written into the graph. And by writing city colon name, I can do that kind of property mapping at runtime. So this approach that I've shown in step one and step two is what I would call normalized loading because we break the table down into tables for labels and then load it in parallel. Um, there's another option, which is which I would call cipher destructuring. Um, as Andrea covered earlier, you can always take a cipher statement and you can write any data frame to the graph by using a simple cipher statement. And so what I did is I took the same example of cities and countries and I did it both ways. Um, the Neo4j connector for Apache Spark is going to always provide you this option. It's really up to you. And I wanted to cover some of the pros and cons of doing it one way versus the other, because this is a thing that a lot of folks will be doing. If you take the normalized loading approach, the pro is that you get an overall faster import. And the reason that, you, that it's going to go faster is because you get to exploit parallelism and cipher partitioning. I also find it a lot easier to find the co uh, to follow the code because if you have a really complicated data frame that you have to break down, um, you can follow all of the steps. And when you get it to the tables for labels format, it's fairly obvious how tables for labels goes into Neo4j because of that nice mapping. The downside of the normalized approach is that you have to do more upfront work in order to make it work. And if your graph data model were to change radically, you're going to have to change more code because of course you decomposed your data frame into the tables for labels structure. Now, on the other hand, Cypher destructuring is when you just simply take any data frame and process it with one big Cypher query. 
Um, now, if you're in Neo4j Pro, this is probably the easiest and fastest way to get started, but the downsides are several. First of all, it's not going to be parallelizable. When you create a Cypher query that creates lots of nodes and relationships in one query, you're going to create a lot of locks in the graph, which is a bad fit for parallelizing your data load. Um, also, it tends to be a little bit harder to follow because what I find a lot of users do is that they mix in data cleaning operations inside of their Cypher statement together with actual load operations. And so a major con here is that, you know, Spark is this really fantastic environment for manipulating, transforming, and cleaning data. And when you push that work to Cypher and then you do it within a single thread, usually performance suffers and the code is harder to follow simply because you're you're not using Neo4j for the right operation there. So when we're dealing with Cypher, uh, sorry, when we're dealing with Spark and really large data loads, um, a, a thing that's going to come up very commonly is that people are going to need to push this to get the, the, the best possible throughput that they can to Neo4j. And so we wanted to cover two critical performance controls here. The first is batch size. Now, when Andrea was speaking earlier about the unwind operation, uh, he was saying that basically the rows in the data frame get put into a batch. We un unwind that array as event. And this in turn means that we need a configurable batch size so that we can control how much memory Neo4j uses for each transaction. So in general, the larger the batch size you go with, the better overall performance that you're, that you're going to get out of the system. But it's limited by Neo4j's available heap. If you're trying to put in eight gigabytes worth of data and you only have one gigabyte of heap, then obviously you can't do that in one batch and you're gonna have to divide it into lots of batches. So a lot of folks ask us what's the basic, basic best starting point. And usually we say about 20,000 is a good starting point on the low end and you can move up from there. But it depends quite a lot on how much heap your instance has free. So if you happen to know that you've got a very large configured heap, you could go quite a bit large, uh, larger than this and get better throughput that way. The second is the number of partitions. And so you might've seen that um, we repartitioned the data in an earlier example. Um, partitions is basically like a parallelism control for how many simultaneous worker nodes in Spark you want to use and how many databases you want to use at the same time. Now, in the case of reads, you can speed up reads by if you have to pull a million records out of Neo4j, maybe you want to chop that into four groups of 250,000 each and get a performance improvement that way. On the right side, we need to consider locking and so on in order to get best performance when doing partitioning. Basically, the partitions control is about how many simultaneous queries you want to run on Neo4j at the same time. And the consequences to consider are a trade-off between locking and total throughput on the read and write sides. So when we're using this uh, connector, we wanted to basically boil down a lot of this stuff into a set of best practices. So here's how you get really great performance out of Neo4j and the, and the, the Neo4j connector for Apache Spark. Normally, I, I, I would recommend using the normalized loading approach. Basically clean your data up in Spark and focus Neo4j's work on the ingest and just the right parts. The second thing that you wanna do is make sure that you set a batch size that makes sense taking your total heap into consideration. The third thing is to exploit uh, Spark's parallelism to partition your writes and get parallel throughput wherever you can. And again, the tables for labels construct is a key way that you can do that. The next thing that you're gonna to wanna to consider is to cache your Spark data frames to increase your throughput. Um, this is a very Spark specific point, but in a lot of cases, if you do a lot of transformations to a data frame, it will benefit you to cache it intermediately so that you don't have to redo computations in Spark. The next suggestion is that you should try to use save mode error if exists, if you can, when you're doing loading into Neo4j. This is because as Andrea pointed out earlier, it generates a create query and it avoids the merge overhead that is associated with needing to look up a node in an index and, and so forth. Now you won't always be able to do this. Sometimes you need to be able to merge into the graph, but if you can make your load in a way that uses the create statement within Cypher, it will typically perform better. And then finally, indexes, indexes, indexes. So when we do writes to the graph using the Spark connector, 
we want to make sure that all of the key fields that we're referring to um, in our Spark code are backed by indexes on the Neo4j side. Now, uh, another key technique that you may come across is the use of user-defined functions. In the Spark environment, we can define special functions and then apply them to columns um, within, the, uh, within the data frame. As it happens, the Neo4j connector for Apache Spark comes with a regular Neo4j driver um, under the hood that can be called from Scala directly. So when you think about how it actually interacts with your Neo4j instance, it's just another Bolt client at the end of the day using Neo4j's official Java driver. So this allows us to do some really cool things within the Spark environment. We can define a function that does a custom lookup by just using Neo4j's regular driver. And then we can apply that function to a data frame and use that to apply a graphy result to any existing table. Um, this isn't possible in PySpark because we need to be able to use the driver directly, but you can do this in Scala. And so what I've done here is I've defined a simple Scala function in the top right that counts the number of descendants that a person has in our graph. What we do is we match the person, we match any number of child relationships, and then we count the distinct number of children that are descended from the person that we, we are interested in. And then we basically take that count descendants function and turn it into a Scala UDF. So then what we do in our, in our Spark code is basically add a column to our data set um, with, that's called descendants and use the, the computation of that UDF as the value of that column. And so what we can then do is count the descendants for everybody in a data frame. And this is a really cool and very flexible technique because if there's any way that graph can add value to your data set, you can systematically add it or, um, as an um, appended result on top of any other record in any other data frame from any source. So with that, I'd like to pass it back over to Andrea, who will talk a little bit about the graph-driven ML use case. Thank you, David. So uh, nowadays, we are surrounded by graph algorithm. Uh, in particular, we use one uh, every day while we are trying to find, to find something on the internet and while we are trying to, to search something on Google because uh, Google results uh, are uh, ordered by uh, uh, the result of the computation of a, gra a graph algorithm called uh, PageRank. That orders uh, uh, the results uh, in order to show to you the most relevant so it's quite trivial that uh, graph-based uh, machine learning uh, is an incredible and uh, incredible and powerful uh, tool for any task that in involves uh, uh, pattern matching over uh, large data sets. And uh, Neo4j has this library, the graph data science library, which provides a ton of graph uh, highly optimized uh, graph algorithms in order to extract to, uh, to extract insights from uh, your data. So, but uh, what has this in common uh, with Apache Spark? And in particular with our connector, this means that you can basically uh, uh, run via the, uh, the uh, Neo4j uh, connector for Apache Spark, the graph data science uh, uh, algorithm uh, over Neo4j, and then you can get back the result uh, into a data frame. And then you can join the re this data frame, which is the result of the computation of a graph algorithm, with any other data frame that can be a parquet file, a protobuf uh, uh, data frame, uh, a, a CSV file uh, over uh, stored uh, in HDFS, or you can uh, put the results into a data lake. Another thing that you can do if you have a Neo4j causal cluster is to uh, load back uh, the results uh, into the causal cluster itself. So if you have a Neo4j causal cluster, uh, uh, one of the best practice uh, is to, uh, uh, of using the, the graph data science uh, library in this environment is to uh, split uh, uh, the read replica of the cluster and transforming it into a single node instance then uh, install and uh, run the uh, graph algorithm uh, on this single instance. And at that point, uh, 
you can use the Neo4j uh, connector for Apache Spark in order to load back the results from this single instance into a causal cluster. So uh, uh, we arrived uh, to the end of uh, this presentation and uh, I want to wrap up uh, uh, what, we, what we said today and the goal of uh, this project. So uh, we built the uh, Neo4j connector for uh, Apache Spark in order to uh, avoid the custom IP solution and provide to the developers uh, 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 very simple and clean APIs in order to uh, write the, their Spark jobs uh, against uh, Neo4j. The plugin is characterized by continuous development. In fact, we plan to support uh, uh, Spark 3 very soon. We try to answer uh, to the issues on uh, GitHub and uh, on Zdesk uh, very quickly. There is, a, as David uh, said before, an official uh, enterprise support uh, by uh, Neo4j through Larus. And uh, we leverage uh, the data source, the Spark data source API in order to be fully Spark compliant. This means that the, the plugin is polyglot. So uh, data scientists and data engineers can use both uh, uh, this plugin in order to uh, interact uh, uh, with Neo4j via Spark. And you can use the plugin in order to build the two main classes of application, ATL pipelines and graph-driven machine learning. So uh, I, I think that we have uh, some time in order to, to take that. There are a lot of questions actually, and I think that we have some time in order to get some of them. Great, thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you, David. And I, and I have to say, it's not every connections that we get an appearance by Drake. So that was awesome. Um, we have had lots of questions, and I do want to remind the audience if they have questions to submit, they can do so using the questions tab located at the top of their screen. But let's get started with some we've received throughout the presentation. Um, so here's one that asks. Which versions and distributions of Spark does this work with? Like, for example, does it work with Databricks? So uh, one of the interesting things about the Spark ecosystem is it's fairly fractured. So there is Apache Spark and there's the Scala versions that we talked about. But there are a lot of vendors that put out solutions based on Spark. Um, so, for example, each of the major cloud platforms has its own Spark. And then there are, you know, the, the Clouderas of the world and the Databricks of the world. What we're really trying to do is focus on support for a particular version of Apache Spark. And so we've tested it with Databricks and it's working great uh, on, on the specific question of Databricks. Now, when you go to some of the cloud managed Spark environments, they have uh, many different versions of Spark that you can launch. And for that, I need to refer folks back to the support matrix that's gonna be in our documentation and that Andrea went through. If you have Spark 2.4.5 or above, then the, the connector should work fine with that. Now, that, that's not exactly the same thing as saying that it's going to work with every single version of Cloudera um, because some of the commercial Spark distributions use much earlier versions of Spark. So that version compatibility is an important thing to check. Got it, thank you for that clarification. Um, so another question came in about, does it work with the Neo4j community? Is that the community edition, I'm guessing? And what about Neo4j Aura? Uh, would you like to take that, Andrea? Oh, yes. Uh, um, yeah, we support all the uh, Neo4j uh, uh, versions. I mean, we support community, we support enterprise, and we support uh, uh, Neo4j Aura. As I said, we support Neo4j 3.5, 4.0, and uh, 4.1 at this moment. And uh, yeah, we plan to support uh, 4.2, which uh, will out uh, soon. Yes, yeah, the, the key thing on this point of, of compatibility with different editions of Neo4j to remember is that under the covers, this connector is a Bolt client. It uses the standard official Java um, library for um, connecting to Neo4j. And under the covers, it is running Cypher itself. And so there's really nothing special or magical that's happening here. It's a client connector that, that issues Cypher queries to your Neo4j instance. And as a result, it is going to work with those different environments. Great, thank you so much. And of course, the million dollar question always is what does it cost? Uh, well, uh, 
one of my goals with some of these supported connectors, it, like I said, is to, to make people's Neo4j subscription and Neo4j's, Neo4j graphs more valuable over time. And so it is included with uh, the enterprise bundle if a customer has an existing enterprise bundle. And so it's not a separate upcharge or an extra amount of money. It simply comes with Neo4j Enterprise Edition. So there, there's no cost to, to consider beyond uh, what's paid for Neo4j. Yeah, and the code is uh, on GitHub, so it, it's open source. So. Yeah, that, that's correct. Um, we, we, do, uh, we do like to develop a lot of things in open source here at Neo4j, and so um, the entire repository is publicly available under the Apache 2 license. Isn't that right, Andrea? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great, thanks so much. And um, good to know that it's uh, part of the, the package deal, so to speak. Um, looks like we have time for maybe one more question. And I want to remind the audience, if your question wasn't answered, uh, you can send an email to webinar at neo4j.com and we'll get you routed to the appropriate person. But let's take this last question. Um, so what kind of scale of data can the connector work with? Okay. Um, so in the, um, uh, in, in, the, in the Apache Spark world, you can scale Spark clusters out to pretty much any size. Uh, now Neo4j on the other hand has a leader follower um, uh, architecture. And so the way that Neo4j and, scale, and, and Spark scale together depends on the use case. Neo4j scales writes vertically. That is to say in our causal cluster architecture, we have one leader and in order to get more writes out of the leader, you typically add hardware and you, you get a bigger machine. And Neo4j scales reads out horizontally, which is to say that you can add more machines and always service more reads. And so if your use case is to read data from Neo4j into Spark, uh, Neo4j should, should be able to scale out quite nicely because there shouldn't be any problem with, for example, doing uh, reads with a very large number of partitions if you have enough machines to support that on the Neo4j side. On writes, it's a little bit different. Um, because writes scale vertically, we would usually recommend that the, the partitions on the writes not go beyond the number of cores that the Neo4j server has. And so um, it's very common when writing data from Spark to Neo4j to need to repartition that data set to make sure that the, that the, the, the writes are um, performant and appropriate for your Neo4j setting. But so the bottom line here is that the primary scaling characteristics are going to be limited by Neo4j configuration, whether that is hardware on the leader or heap or page cache size. And those are the things to, to keep in mind. On the Neo4j website, there's some really great guidance about how to tune that, that stuff for best performance. And all of those factors are the same for Spark and bear consideration. Yeah, and it's also important to prefer the uh, normalized lo loading uh, instead of uh, the cipher destructuring because uh, uh, as uh, David said uh, in the part of uh, his presentation, uh, it has a big influence, uh, a big impact uh, on the performances. So uh, keep that in mind uh, when you're trying to, to, to implement the best practice uh, with this connector. Yeah, that's right. If you if you want to put 100 million rows of data frames into Neo4j, it, it really bears thinking this through carefully to get the best performance. I mean, so for example, if you have a really small batch size, you're going to be doing many, many, many transactions. And if you do that with Cypher, you're going to be single threading the right operation. And that's not going to be a, a good experience um, for you or the best utilization of your Neo4j instance. And so um, we've put a lot of information in the documentation that goes a little bit deeper into this denormalized loading approach and how to get the best performance out of it. And we're um, happy to get feedback from the community and iteratively improve that as well over time. Great. Thank you both for that explanation. Um, it looks like we are about out of time for this session. So I just wanted to thank you again, Andrea. Thank you, David. Pleasure having both of you with mm -hmm. us today. Thank you. And to our audience, our next session will be starting shortly. So stick around and that will be um, going just a minute. And again, thank you, Andrea. And thank you, David.